let's go ahead and, and shift some gears a, a little bit. Texas does pick up a commit from uh, a linebacker out of Lubbock, uh, Lubbock Cooper, if I'm correct, um, by the name of Kobe McKenzie, uh, a former OU commit, uh, Jason. And, you know, we, we've heard so much about the offensive guys transferring and going to different places, but, you know, defensive guy kind of does. And it's interesting because he does it right before Oklahoma names a defensive coordinator to be their head coach. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, you know, if he waits another day or two, you can see what happens. But tell us what you can about uh, Kobe uh, McKenzie and that commit uh, from a, you know, area of need that, you know, obviously Texas needs to get stronger in that position. Yeah, they do. Linebackers, a big need for them. And um, this one's kind of interesting how it all went down. I mean, this whole new era of transfer portal and I mean, coaches leaving, that's not new, of course, but, you know, the Lincoln Riley thing still is sending shockwaves through college football a little bit. But uh, the day Lincoln Riley took the USC job, Kobe McKenzie decommits from Oklahoma. He'd been committed for like two years. On more, I think it was one year and 10 months or something. That was something ridiculous. So he'd been there forever. He's a Rivals 250 player. He's a top national player. Texas never recruited him. I mean, Kobe wanted to be recruited by Texas. Texas never recruited him. I don't know if that's because he had been committed to Oklahoma for so long. The, the staff comes in. Um, they don't feel like they really have a shot. But for whatever reason, they never really entertained the idea of pursuing Kobe McKenzie until he decommits from Oklahoma. Then the Texas staff gets in touch with him, his family. Um, there were rumors going around pretty quickly that Kobe McKenzie was going to commit to Texas before he was ever even offered, mind you. Um, mm -hmm. The other Texas commitments were like, oh, yeah, he's coming to Texas. Well, well uh, later last week, Texas visits him in person. The coaches give him a formal scholarship offer. He then officially sets up his official visit to Texas for this past weekend. Um, I talked to Kobe's dad yesterday on their drive home from Lubbock. The family was riding home and Kobe was in the back seat with his earbuds. And he said, so I'm talking to his dad. His dad's a great guy. Uh, Orange Blood subscriber, by the way, as of oh. yesterday. So, yeah, so welcome to Orange, <laughs> welcome to Orange Bloods. Um, uh, and we were talking and he was telling me about the visit and just raving about everything, the 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 people there, obviously the facilities, the academic people they met, mostly the coaches, though, um, Coach Choate and Kwiatkowski, they really got the red carpet treatment from them. His dad told me on the way home off the record, he said, hey, go ahead and have a commitment story ready. Well, little did he know I already had one written. So <laughs> well, you know, watching this, I already had one written when you told me that. But um, but I didn't think it was going to happen Sunday night. I thought it was going to because his dad's like, yeah, you may do a video. Well, you know, we'll see how it's going to happen. And then lo and behold, Sunday night at 8.15, boom, he announces on Instagram that he's committed. So I'm like, uh oh, I better get that commitment story published. Um, but yeah, really good player. I mentioned it, Rivals 250 member, position of need. I mean, it's no secret Texas needs help at the linebacker spot. What I like about Kobe McKenzie are a couple of things, okay? He's got a nose for the football. You kind of have to if you're a linebacker, right, if you're any good. Um, he's going to graduate early and enroll early. So he'll get a chance to go through spring football, which is big. Um, we have him in our database, 6'3", 225, as I look at this. His dad told me he's actually 245 pounds right now. Mm. Yeah, it's a little heavy. Even the Texas coaches have said, hey, if there's one thing we want, if we're going to be critical of one area with you, it's that we need to uh, reposition, I think was the word, some of this weight. And they'll do that, like he and his dad and I were saying, Listen, man, he's he's a teenager. Oh, it's easy for those guys to reposition weight. Not so not so easy for the rest of us. <laughs> um, but you know, they'll get him in in January. They'll put him on whatever nutrition program they need to. They'll get him on a, a workout plan. But you know, he's a different player than the linebackers Texas has on campus. I think if you know, they in fact they did a good job. They cut up some some of his film and some of the Texas film and played it side by side and said and it, it's basically the same defensive scheme. So they said, hey, Kobe you won't have a learning curve. You'll come in here and you'll know the defense. Look at what you can do with your style of play. A big guy who can, you know, eat up space in the middle, but still athletic and can still cover ground. We package you with the Marvin Overshone. Boom. It's the perfect combination. So they did a really good job of selling him uh, on that front. You know, I, if you think of the linebackers on campus, um, Anwar, I mean, he's different. Then, I mean, Dele, at a, De, well, Dele is in the transfer portal, right? Yes, correct. So he's not even on campus anymore. But, you know, he's he's more like Dele at a, at a, oh yeah, I'm going to butcher his last name, in that he's more of a thumper in the middle. But uh, Kobe McKenzie 
is much more athletic than than Dele is in terms of covering sideline to sideline. So um, really good pickup. I mean, listen, there's a reason Oklahoma wanted him, but Texas came in and kind of took advantage of, of a unique, unique opportunity when it presented itself. They didn't waste any time, uh, locked him up on that official visit. So really good pickup. Rivals 250 member with that, that in itself tells you he's a pretty good player. Yeah, you know what it, he looks like when you looked at his film, um, Jason? It was almost like you're right in saying he doesn't look like anything that's on campus. It almost looks like when you look at their recruiting, they're recruiting to for guy, bodies for the SEC yeah. more so than the Big 12. So that looks like that big body kind of linebacker that you expect to see there more so than this maybe smaller guys that you know that you see in the big 12 where you know like even demarvion he's a little bit undersized for a linebacker because he was converted safety right it, mm -hmm. it looks like that's what it looks like to me is looks like a body that they're saying okay three years from now when we need some people to bang that's yeah. who we have more so than what what you need right now versus like baylor which not to say they don't need yeah. someone versus baylor jesus hey, you baylor can run up and down on you too and, and the sac is going to a little more wide open but you've got to have both of those combinations you, you can't throw you know a bunch of 220 pound linebackers here i mean you've got to have some thumpers in the middle and, and uh you know mckenzie it's funny when texas first started recruiting him i was talking to some other recruiting reporters and we're just kind of bouncing thoughts and I remember a couple guys told me, well, I think he'll end up being an, an edge guy. He's too big to be a middle linebacker. Well, be a linebacker. Well, that's not what Texas is telling him. I mean, they are saying, hey, we need to, you know, kind of trim you up a little bit here. But now they're recruiting him to be a linebacker that can still play in space and cover sideline to sideline while still patrolling, being big and strong enough to, to patrol in, uh, between the tackles, but still be athletic enough to get outside the numbers when needed. So they've got the, the commitment from Kobe, which is their third commitment since October. Where, where does Texas stand with some of these other guys? Since I've, I've got you here, um, where does Texas stand with some of these other guys who, you know, they're recruiting? You know, what, what can you tell us that maybe we had in a war room recently? Um, was, you know, some, some of the other guys that, so just give us some of the names. And as we are, what are we, what are we about nine days away from signing? Nine days, days from like the, the first day of the early signing period. Yeah, so... Um, you know, I'm, I've just pulled up my recruiting board, as you said that. I'm going to just kind of, if you see me glance on the side, I'll just go position by position. Um, at quarterback, they've got Malik Murphy. They really wanted to get Devin Brown. He ended up picking Ohio State, ironically, with all the Quinn Ewers stuff. He picked Ohio State last week over Texas. Uh, Devin Brown's a, I tell you what, he's a really good prospect as a quarterback. I mean, really, really good prospect as a quarterback. I think he's a five-star type quarterback. He put a video clip of himself on Twitter this week and he's wearing bands and he basically Omar does like a two steps, jumps vertical, windmill, dunk, boom. I'm like, whoa, I did not know wow. this dude was that kind of athlete. So wow. I was like, I thought he was really good before that. And I was like, okay, you can dunk like that. You're a pretty good athlete. But it's it's looking probably like Malik Murphy is going to be the only quarterback in this class, barring something crazy happening, or maybe if they target if they find someone to target in February. Um, running back, uh, Jaden blue is their only running back commitment. You know, they lost a commitment, uh, to Jamarian, Jamarian Miller decommitted and went to Alabama. They did offer a young man named Ollie Gordon recently. I think it was last week. I talked to Ollie and he's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm going to stick with Oklahoma state. You know, I've been committed there a long time. And, uh, so, you know, he, he didn't say a hundred percent no, but he said, I'm probably not even going to visit Texas. So, Right now, I'm thinking probably just one running back commitment. Um, yeah. Wide receiver, you know, they've got they only have one wide receiver commitment. Um, they had a guy on campus this week named Kendrick Law for an official visit. He's kind of a DB wide receiver. He's an athlete. You know, you get him on campus and then you figure it out from there. Um, I was told this weekend on his official visit, Texas was more talking to him. The, the defensive coaches were more involved than the offensive coaches, I think. So, I think probably he'd wind up being a defensive back for Texas, maybe a safety. Uh, but Kendrick Law is a guy. Um, another one, they, they just offered a receiver named Savion Red, who was mm -hmm. committed to SMU. He decommitted when uh, Sonny Dykes left. Kind of flown under the radar because he'd been committed early. And he was not a really highly ranked guy, but he's going to be in Austin this week for an official visit, I think, beginning on Thursday. So it'll be one of these kind of midweek visits that overlaps into the weekend. Um, Shaz Preston's a receiver out of Louisiana. Texas is still recruiting. You can skip over tight end. There's not much going on there. It really comes down to this class on where it's going to come down to offensive line, how they finish at offensive line. 
as I pull up the board, and you've got Cam Dewberry uh, from Atascacita. He's mm-hmm. down to three, um, Texas being one of his finalists. I think it's going to be Texas or Texas A&M there. Oklahoma is still involved, but Oklahoma is going through a coaching change. You don't even know, you know, is Bill Biddenball going to be there, their offensive line coach. So I think it's going to be Texas or Texas A&M. I still favor A&M, but, you know, hey, some news could come out Monday that could change things. So there's some NIL stuff about to come out with Texas. And I mentioned Kelvin Banks. Texas met with Kelvin Banks, and they did say to him, hey, we've got some NIL opportunities. He's another five-star offensive lineman. Uh, Malik Ogbo is a lineman out of the uh, Washington State area. He's going to commit on December 15th. It's probably Texas or Auburn. Oklahoma was heavily involved there. It's probably Texas or Auburn. I'm cautiously saying Texas right now. I think Texas is going to wind up getting him. If you if you believe what he's telling other Texas recruits, they feel really good about their chances. Um, Nato Umiozulu is an offensive lineman out of Allen. He's a we've talked about him on our modcast. He's a complete wild card. He could commit to Texas today. He could wait till February and end up committing to USC. I don't really have a great feel for Nato, but I think Texas is right there along with anybody else. Uh, Devon Campbell is the five star offensive lineman that. Anybody who follows Texas recruiting even remotely has heard the name Devon Campbell. Um, You know, he's supposed to decide during this early window. So in the next week and a half, he's not going to announce until uh, the Under Armour All-American game. So is it possible he could wait if he's just not sure? It's possible. But, you know, Texas has been long believed to be the leader for Devon Campbell. But he's now taking what's going to be his third visit to USC. He took an official visit there. He took an unofficial visit there. He's now taking a second official visit there. There's a rule now when head coaching change guys can take second official visits. So uh, keep an eye on USC with Devon Campbell. So really, I mean, Texas needs to hit on two, maybe three of those offensive line. If they can do that, if they can flip a guy like Kelvin Banks from Oregon, uh, this is a tremendously successful class. If they can't close on some of those offensive linemen, it's going to be, it's going to be a big disappointment down the stretch for Texas. In the other area, you know, they just picked up a linebacker. They're pretty good on defensive linemen. They're still working for de- uh, defensive backs. They did just pick up a recommitment from Jalen Gilbo. He committed to Texas, decommitted, committed to TCU, decommitted from TCU, is now back at Texas. Um, so they're still working on – they've got him back in the fold, and they're still working on him. I mentioned Kendrick Law and a guy named Larry Turner Goodens, a defensive back out of California. So some moving parts. We should, like you said, in nine days, we should have a lot of answers to – most, if not all of these things, um, to me, it's all, it's going to be sink or swim for this class. And listen, I say sink or swim. It, it's going to be a good class regardless. If Texas misses on most of those offensive linemen, it'll still be a good class, but it's not going to be the type of class people expected it to be, or certainly it could have been, or maybe should have been if they don't close on some of those offensive linemen. So that's where the big focus is coming down the stretch. One more on on that. And, and then I got one more subject when we get out of here. You think this is a top 10 class when it's all said and done, Jason, or is it borderline? Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's funny you ask. It's a good question. Um, two months ago, I would have said absolutely, 100% top 10 class. Two weeks ago, I would have said probably not. I'm back to saying yes, I think it is, because I think Texas is going to hit on some of these offensive linemen. I think you're going to see some things in the works here. I keep mentioning Kelvin Banks. I've been saying for two weeks – He's saying he's still solid with Oregon. I'm telling you, Texas is a bigger player there. There's confidence on the Texas side, and there's a reason for that. I think Texas has a really good chance there if they get Devon Campbell, maybe Nato. Um, I'm banking on Texas getting a couple of these offensive linemen on Mars. So, yes, I do think it's going to be a top-10 class. Okay. So, one of the last things, Jason, we can we can start to wrap up, you know, kind of off Texas, but this is, you know, overreaction Monday. Oh, you finally find a head coach. You know, they go and, and get the Clemson defensive coordinator, Brent Venables, um, who you know, you know the name, we're all kind of familiar with. I'm just kind of curious your general reaction to OU's decision to, to hire Venables. Huh. Yeah, you know, I've got mixed feelings. Um, it doesn't blow me away, if I'm being completely honest, but then I look back at OU's hiring history. Um that's what people thought when they hired Bob Stoops, right? And he goes mm-hmm. down as one of the greatest. And he was a similar guy as a defensive coordinator, um, comes to Oklahoma, and he's one of the greatest college coaches you know, in, in history, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, Lincoln Riley, you know, on where you and I've talked, I think we're both big Lincoln Riley fans, right? We have been, um, I've all, but Lincoln Riley was kind of a plug and play guy. He was there under stoops. He stepped into, you know, he was running the offense there. So he just, he stepped into a pretty good situation there. Um, Benables to me is a little bit risky. You know, I mean, he doesn't have the experience, but as far as coordinators go, I mean, he is the biggest name out there. His name has been rumored for head coaching jobs for, I don't know how many years I've lost count, but every year his name is the big name in terms of, Oh, he's the coordinator that's going to make the jump to head coaching hires, but he's never really shown much interest. You know, this job, I think just seemed to be the perfect opportunity there. He's, he's had experience at Oklahoma. Um, I think it's, you know, I think he'll be a good hire, but I'm just, it doesn't blow me away. I kind I'm kind of in, of the mold, especially in the last few years. I like guys like Lincoln Riley. Um, I like guys like Steve Sarkeesian. I mean, we'll see the jury's still out on that. I like guys like Sonny Dykes. I like, I like offensive minded guys, young offensive minded guys. Um, you know, we'll see what Venables can do in terms of hiring coordinators and that type of stuff. But, uh, I don't know. I, I kind of lean more strongly towards hiring young offensive minded guys. Those are the guys to me that, uh, well, I say that and you got Nick Saban still out there, right? But, uh, <laughs> well, well yeah, and, 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 and you've got Dave Aranda just winning yes, the Big 12 exactly. title <laughs> as a former DC. Time. But but continue, Jason. Yeah, I mean, Every time this tiger changes his stripes a little bit, but um, <laughs> you know, I think Venables will be a good coach. You know, he's a known name. I think he'll probably help him in recruiting and he'll help tighten up some of this chaos that they've had the last week and a half or whatever it's been. But um, you know, I don't know that he's a slam dunk surefire hire the way Lincoln Riley when they hired Lincoln Riley I was like oh that's that's easy that's no brainer he's gonna he's gonna be successful I don't have that same feeling about Brent Venables I'm gonna need to see it a little bit from Brent Venables first yeah you know it's for me I I don't I don't know I thought when Lincoln got hired I I was of the perception that oh well Texas has the advantage because Tom Herman's this proven coach and Lincoln Riley like I mean he's he's been you know OC but he's never really held the, the thing and he ends up being one of the best coaches of the modern era, top five, top three easily uh, right now. So, you know, it's funny. One of the things I was like, I'm not going to read the obituary on OU quite yet yeah. because they seemingly have had some good fortune uh, with their hiring and their coaches. But the one thing you and I can attest to, uh, Jason, is that when you hire a new coach and have to potentially hire 10 assistants, it's not an, it's not easy in year one. I mean, and OU hasn't had that issue. OU's only kind of been able to have to plug in one guy, two guys, never never had to do a potential overhaul. And overhauls are, are not uh are not easy to do. What did you think uh, last thing, Jason? What did you think of Baylor? Uh Aranda, what did you think about the job that they that they've done this year? Yeah, remarkable. I mean, nobody ever saw that coming. I don't know if Dave Aranda would have told you he saw that coming before mm-hmm. the season started. I mean. That goes. That will go down as, I think Catch wrote about it. But seriously, maybe the best coaching job ever in the Big Twelve is that good. I don't know. I mean, to, to turn that program around so quickly from what they were last year in his second year, uh, go out and win the Big Twelve title is pretty remarkable. And the Big Twelve wasn't as top heavy this year as it has been in the past. Maybe you didn't have Oklahoma being the, you know, the world beater it has been at times, but. Still, just a remarkable job. I mean, tip of the cap to, to Aranda and Baylor. And, you know, kind of like it. Everything I've ever heard or know about Aranda is he's a, just a great guy. So, you know, kudos to him on the job well done. Well, what's fascinating about that is, you know, they win two games in this in this first year, but it's a COVID year, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's there. you can't either you're coaching through Zoom. You, you're not really getting a chance to do spring and all. Season. So you kind of you have to take your lumps and then he finally gets a chance to get in there and have a full off season going to transfer portal. Aranda's one of these guys that, you know, when you guys, you know, when we've had these conversations with you and catch, you guys always know, I always say, well, how many five stars does it take to be a TCU? (laughs) Aranda is one of these guys that some, I feel like proves the point that sometimes that at some point coaching matters. Right. And we're going to get into the stars and, you know, there's a lot of star chasing that happens, but Baylor has as, just as many big 12 championships as Texas does three, both mm-hmm. of these, both of these programs have three in one program is, you know, it's, we talk about is, is the top 10 is the top five is the top, whatever is the other programs or like the, you know, Baylor's or, or Oklahoma States, or we see seen Iowa state, that just finds a way to coach their talent. So 
Um, so I, I say a hats off and, and a kudos to him. Is there anything else, anything else from a, a Monday that you want to overreact to? If not, we could just start to close it out because I know you probably, you know, we don't do parting shots the way we do in the podcast, <laughs> but so we just go to anything else that on your mind you want to throw at uh, as one of your last things that you'll say. Um, no, can't think of anything. I'm just uh, I'm glad we made it through this podcast or this video with, uh, we, as I told you, we got a new pup yesterday afternoon and it's all been quiet so far. So, uh, <laughs> we should wrap this up before I hear a barking spree in the background, but, uh, no, I think we've covered most of the, the pertinent things on my mind. Obviously Quinn Ewers is the big story. We'll be continuing to track and, uh, that'll, that'll be our, our big chunk of our focus uh, this week. Yeah. I still think I might, I'm, the, I'm, I'm definitely the only person on orange blood staff that doesn't have a dog, doesn't have a pet yeah. of any sort. I don't like the responsibilities of it. Just I don't I, like I, the sleepless nights. I've forgotten, as I told you before we started recording, it's like having a newborn baby, man. I'm, I feel like I got bags. I probably do have bags under my eyes. It's uh, it's going to be a long couple of weeks before you get the sucker trained to sleep through the night. But uh, Sleepless nights. I can't get my boys to sleep in their own room. So <laughs> you better, you better talk about what sleepless nights are. I have two, two growing boys who refuse to sleep in their room, kicking you all night long. <laughs> that That's a sleepless night right there. So... All right, well, Jason, thank you uh, for joining us on this Overreaction Monday. Thank you for filling in for Catch. I feel like in the comments section, people are going to be very kind to you. Uh, <laughs> Please. For all, yeah. everything that says. So make sure you guys leave con- con- nice things. Forgot to say like and subscribe. I guess I was supposed to say that in the beginning of the video, but if you made it an hour in, you probably already like or subscribe to everything anyway. So thanks to uh, you know our sponsor. Thanks for Jason. Uh, for Jason, this is Anwar. Thanks for checking out the Orange Bloods YouTube channel. Make sure you check out everything else on here. Serenity's got videos that are popping up this week. Ari's got videos. Ketch and I will be back at some point. We've got the modcast. Like, we still got you covered. We're doing everything. We've got a bunch of fun stuff planned for Sunday. Day. We don't want to tell you guys everything because then everyone else will just kind of take our ideas and run with it. So, uh, but be prepared for that. We've got some good fun things that are going to be happening on the channel. So, uh, for Jason Sukamel, You guys have a fantastic week. Thank you for watching Overreaction Monday. We'll talk to you soon. See ya.